Your Eminence, good morning. Good morning, Monica. So is there, is there any special message you'd like to, to send out to your friends at Napa, Eminence? Well, I'd firstly uh, like to thank them for the invitation. Uh, I very much admire the work that is being done by Napa. Uh, it is high quality, it's uh, gospel-based, it's Christocentric, uh, uh, it's a wonderful uh, contribution, so I commend um, what you're doing uh, and thank you for it. Um, so we're here obviously to talk about your experience, uh, particularly over the last couple of years. Can you give us some thoughts about your time in prison? What surprised you? What gave you hope? Um, well, uh, it was 13 months. Uh, it was a different time, uh, which goes without... Uh, saying. Uh, I'd visited prisons as a priest uh, and the bishop. Uh, I'd mixed widely so and I had a very limited interaction with the other prisoners so there was no there were no great surprises there. Uh, I was surprised by the uh, decency of the overwhelming majority of the of the prison officers, the warders, um, they would talk, converse, were quite human, uh, decent, and not just with me, but I could hear the way they were dealing with uh, the other fellows in solitary, and some of them were totally unreasonable, frightfully damaged by uh, drugs. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, now, I mean, the original sin exists amongst the warders too, but nonetheless, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by their professionalism and decency. And I, the chaplain confirmed this too. I felt the prison was uh, pretty well run. What gave you hope inside the prison? Well, um, uh, the virtue of Christian hope, of course, is different from human optimism. Uh, Christian uh, hope tells you that uh, no matter what your circumstances are in this life, eventually all will be well. That uh, a good God is in charge, uh, even though terrible things happen, natural disasters, big explosions, uh, as for example recently in um, Beirut. Um, but these things happen from the permissive will of God. Now that's different from human optimism. And um, I knew intellectually, uh, forensically, my case was um, enormously strong. Um, many, many good lawyers said it should never have been brought to court. Uh, but after a succession of knockbacks, uh, while I knew intellectually my case was still strong, I wasn't uh, particularly optimistic in a human sense at all. I wasn't quite sure, uh, especially after my appeal was knocked back, um, I wasn't quite sure what way uh, the things would go. That, that was, a, I suppose, a psychological defence. Being in prison, you were obviously not able to celebrate Mass for more than a year. How did your prayer life change? Well, it changed uh, radically simply from that fact because I, uh, uh, you know, celebrate Mass uh, daily. Uh, and also I had a habit of when people would ask me to pray for them uh, on some significant issue, uh, I would offer Mass for them, where well, obviously I wouldn't uh, be able to do that. And I had many people writing to me for prayers when I was in jail. So I would um, say, a say a memorare for their uh, intention immediately. So uh, that uh, something would be done. Um, 
in jail you've got no excuse that you're too busy to pray uh, so I had a regular prayer uh, routine and um, of uh, the breviary um, um, meditation and um, I followed that uh, spiritual reading generally I followed that every day and then on the Sunday I had a I, I watched Mass View at home at the, the impossible hour of six o'clock in the morning. Um, and then I watched uh, the American Evangelists, uh, Joseph Prince from California and uh, Joel Osteen from uh, Texas. Uh, and I would, uh, in my journal, I'd make a theological critique of their, <laughs> of their efforts. But both of them are very fine preachers and they got big, big following. So your eminence, you mentioned that you had a lot of people asking you for prayers. Uh, how did you keep in contact with people on the outside? Um, well, it was mainly one-sided. I, I uh, received, until I left, uh, about, uh, around about 4,000 letters, as I keep explaining to people. I didn't count them because I knew the, the trouble King David got into when he had a census of his people. Uh, God disapproved. Uh, so I, I didn't, uh, the only letters, nearly all of which I replied to were fellow prisoners. I, uh, although my legal team counseled me not to do that, I thought as a priest I probably should. So with one or two exceptions, I, uh, I replied to all those prisoners. Otherwise, uh, I um, I rarely replied. With some I did, uh, uh, a particularly poignant letter here or there. Uh, some people from um, the, a couple of uh, women from Texas wrote uh, very, very regularly uh, to me and uh, very stimulating and beautiful, interesting letters gave me something to chew on theologically and uh, and. Uh, spiritually. So, uh, um, and I kept in contact with the world through the television. I was able, I had the Herald Sun, which is a daily, um, not a, not a broadsheet, not a highly sophisticated paper, but a pretty good newspaper. And we were only allowed that three times a week in the assessment prison. Um, had to be ordered again every time. You couldn't put in a permanent order. That, uh, that's one of the little, the typical little humiliation um, uh, of the prisons. And um, I, uh, SBS is an ethnic uh, television station here for the multicultural Australia. It's got good international news. So I would watch that um, most nights. So I was uh, uh, pretty well abreast of things and of course people would send me cuttings. Uh, friends uh, sent me uh, loads of articles. Um, uh, they realised that useful to have a bit of intellectual stimulation while I was there. So uh, I, I kept myself uh, uh, occupied and of course I, I, I wrote my journal. I thought I'd be in for three or so months. So I wrote three pages a day, which would have given me, I roughly estimated, a book of 250 pages because I was there 13 months. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I nearly, I considered not continuing to write, but uh, I'm glad I did. It was good therapy and, um, uh, you know, it just might, I might have something to say that can help people. So from the vantage point of prison and seeing the outside world, I guess, through the news and through the letters you were, you were receiving from others. What was your perspective on the year that was while you were in prison? Well, of course, it's now been dominated by the coronavirus. Um, it began uh, slowly enough. I didn't uh, really anticipate it would uh, spreads of these pandemic uh, proportions. Another interest, uh, another area which uh, very much interested me was Brexit. 
I'm, uh, I was a strong supporter of uh, Brexit. I felt uh, if it had been Catholic Europe, and not uh, anti-Christian Europe, uh, my reaction might have been slightly better. But, um, uh, I mean, the English have had self-rule for a thousand years. And um, I was, uh, the Japanese ambassador to the, to the Vatican was lamenting Brexit, the Brexit result to me. And I said, perhaps a little unhelpfully, but directly, I said, well, Japan wouldn't like to be ruled from China. And uh, he conceded that immediately. Another area which was of concern to me was the Amazon Synod. I wasn't quite sure uh, how that was going to turn out. And in the end, it, uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, the results weren't uh, too bad. I felt that uh, some of the people who were uh, were given leadership in the preparation of the synod. Um, one bishop who'd never converted a, a local resident uh, in all these um, decades as a, as a missionary, I, I, I found one or two of those things uh, quite remarkable. But uh, the end result was uh, that as far as I could see, there wasn't too much uh, damage done. What gains there were, um, well, you know, and it'd be for those who were present to say. But I, I as always, I've kept a lively interest in what's going on in the uh, world around me. In, in Australia, we had the terrible bushfires. And then we had uh, floods. Um, so um, we had the cricket, the test cricket, so uh, which I follow closely. Um, so I... I, I I kept abreast of the world. Um, one of the things you must have been keeping abreast of while you were over there were the news, the, the news coming out about the Vatican finances. What are your hopes for the finances in the Vatican? Well, you see, the Vatican is losing money every year. Uh, it was deteriorating even before the coronavirus. I think in the last two years before the coronavirus, uh, um, pandemic, uh, my successor um, said they lost 50 million a year. Um, with the arrival of the, of the virus, that's got consequences for rents, investments, um, but especially uh, it has um, consequences for the Vatican Museum. I mean, they I, I mean, they, I can't remember the exact sums, but they'd bring in 50 or 60 million uh, euros a year. I, I might, but it's a money of that order. Now, that's almost completely gone. Um, now, it's a little bit uh, graphic uh, to say that, uh, you know, the Vatican's going broke because it isn't. Um, it does have not a big patrimony by it, but it'd be less than some of the great American universities, considerably less as a patrimony. Um, but you can't keep losing money at the rate they are at the moment um, forever. So that, uh, it's a very fundamental uh, reality. Uh, it's public knowledge. I'm not, not letting anybody into any state secrets. And nor is it a state secret that they have a uh, very, very looming and very considerable uh, uh, deficit in the pension fund. Now, nearly every other country in Europe has that too, um, but that's not much uh, consolation. Uh, now, I'm well out of it. I'm two or three years behind uh, what people are thinking, but at least in uh, a published sense, I haven't seen any suggestions that would really uh, address the, what is a uh, significant financial uh, challenge, if, if not a radical, uh, a, a radical one. Uh, now, I'm sure the, uh, 
uh, I'm sure the Vatican can rely on the ultimately on the generosity and mutual support of people around the world, but um, uh, you know, if you've got 300 properties and you only generate an income of less than 100,000, there's something wrong with your system. And um, undoubtedly too, it's been bedeviled over the years by inefficiency and corruption. Um, London property deals are probably examples of both. Certainly uh, an example of, uh, of uh, inefficiency. At, at best. And, um, you know, because the church is not a business, it doesn't mean there's any justification for it to be run inefficiently or not to be uh, very strong and vigilant um, against uh, corruption. So um, I think the uh, most, if not all, of the crooks are out of the system. Uh, you can never be quite sure, but of course you've got to be very vigilant. So uh, I've got every confidence in my successor. They're, uh, uh, they're heading in the right direction, but that promise has got to be brought to fruit. They've just appointed a new finance council. Quite a number of half, half them almost are women, you know, highly qualified women. And... Um, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, because uh, that they will have a good look at the situation and uh, take a very firm stand on what are the basic issues and not be distracted into theorizing or uh, uh, short-term consolation. So I'm, I, I'm, uh, I have a qualified optimism. So back to your time in prison for a minute, what sustained your hope during prison, both personally and, and your hope for the church? Um, well, they're two quite different things. Um, and I think my faith was an enormous, uh, enormous benefit, but the particular element in the faith uh, is uh, our belief in redemptive suffering. Now, uh, the humiliation of jail, the uh, the quiet, uh, the boredom, um, th that uh, just by itself uh, could be very crippling. But as a Christian, we be we believe we were saved by Christ's death on the cross. More than any, his life too has culminated in his resurrection. But. Uh, you know, I was quite confident that my small sufferings, and they weren't enormous, um, were something that could be offered uh, with Christ's suffering for the good of the church. Um, now, I knew I was innocent. Uh, I knew logically and forensically I had a very, very strong case that I would be vindicated. But um, in a spectacular failure, two of the... Uh, most senior judges in Victoria uh, were unable to see that. And I got a letter from a long-term prisoner who said, the consensus amongst the career criminals is that you've been stitched up, that of course you're innocent. And he said, isn't it strange that the criminals can see this and the judges can't? And, um, uh, you know, I understand that. Now, hope for the church, uh, of course, we're going through strange times, difficult times in the church. In the Western world, there are enormous pressures um, on the church. Um, part of the mix in Australia, in my own situation, uh, was anti-Catholicism and, of course, um, the scandal of pedophilia has been used massively by our enemies to f further discredit us. There's no getting away from the crimes that were committed. They were infamous, nor were they dealt with well. But in Australia, we broke the back of the offending in the middle 90s. This was even acknowledged by the Council assisting in the Royal Commission 
who said, you know, the statistic dropped away. So in many dioceses now, uh, I heard of a public meeting where a friend of mine who actually knew what was going on asked the authorities in that diocese, how many offences have you had in the Catholic institutions this century? And there were none, or almost none. And the Catholic audience there was stupefied, had no idea of this. Um, so I think uh, that we made uh, the authorities, the Truth, Justice and Healing Commission, made a uh, significant error in not explaining to people it might have been unpopular, that in fact uh, the old church from the middle 90s had acted resolutely and effectively to uh, impede this uh, plague, to prevent the offences uh, uh, continuing. So um, that's just a, a, a local example. There's considerable confusion. Um, many parts of the, of the world, the church is, uh, you know, say in Africa, going ahead. Um, but we're, we're uh, under pressure in many places, especially in the Western world. There is a steady erosion. But if that's the price we have to pay uh, to maintain gospel purity uh, in our teachings, uh, then it's a price we will pay. But the irony of it uh, is, <clears throat> and it's demonstrated in the liberal Protestant world, it's demonstrated in the Catholic world, in Belgium, Holland, Quebec, to some extent Switzerland and Austria, the more you adapt to the world, the faster the Catholic Church goes out of business. Uh, now, we believe Christ was divine, therefore we believe that his teachings have got a unique authority. We have no authority to distort or diminish Christ's teachings. And if we're following Christ, uh, then we're always in a chance that some leader will rise up and uh, help us. Now, I think this has happened already uh, in the last century through Opus Dei, the neocatechumenal way, just as it did in the 16th century with the Jesuits, in the 13th century, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, and earlier with the Benedictines. I mean, God is with us, and God's providence um, is at work. And that's much more likely to work if we're struggling to do what he wants. And uh, we recognize, you know, as a bishop, I have authority to explain and defend the apostolic tradition. I'm not its master. I can't change it at will. Uh, and please God, inadvertently, I won't damage it. <coughs> you mentioned before that, that your case was strong, you knew you were innocent, um, but yet you spent 400 days or so in prison. Mm -hmm. Obviously a grave injustice, your immense. What kept you from bitterness? Oh, well, I think my Christian faith and Christian teaching. Uh, and probably uh, a recognition that even from a secular human point of view, bitterness is corrosive and uh, damaging. Um, but uh, not being bitter is a little bit like faith. It's not something you can put in your pocket and it's there forever. Uh, you have to continue to pray that your faith will remain strong. And I suppose you have to pray and be vigilant that you don't lapse into a self-centered uh, bitterness and get, uh, uh, you know, very hostile or very cross with this or for the, with that. So, uh, but it was a Christian, my Christian teaching above all that urged me in the right direction on, that, on these issues. Look, in conclusion, as uh, someone from Australia who... Uh, has had a lot to do with uh, the United States uh, as a great uh, friend and not an uncritical admirer of the United States, but a great uh, friend and ally of the United States. Uh, I would just like uh, to remind uh, you know, the audience of just how central and vital 
the role of the Catholic Church in the United States is not just for the English-speaking world, but for the whole of the Western world. Um, now you've had your problems, your scandals of uh, leadership. That is, uh, you know, deeply wounding. I can, uh, I can understand that on top of all of the, the, the pedophilia scandals. But overwhelmingly, many, many uh, parts of the uh, uh, United States um, are heading uh, in the right direction, like your Californian bishops, uh, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, uh, Bishop in San Francisco, um, Cardinal Dolan, uh, I think of the great leadership of Cardinal Francis George. Now, it's vitally important for us in the, uh, the smaller countries. We, we rely on you for your scholarship, for your leadership, uh, and the pastoral strategies that you implement and that prove to be successful will be watched uh, and imitated uh, uh, by us. So I thank you for... Uh, the Church in the United States, personified in this case in Napa. I thank you for what you're doing. And in the deepest and best sense of the word, I wish you Godspeed. May God be with you so that uh, you're wise and prudent and energetic. And in the face of all the hostility that uh, uh, we have, you'll continue to be able to bring Christ uh, to people. And of course, adversity is not necessarily bad for the Church. Uh, adversity can uh, bring the best out of it. So God bless and Godspeed. In this talk, I want to address the topic of maintaining our mental health during these very challenging times of the COVID pandemic. In my own clinical practice as a psychiatrist, in my own department with my fellow clinicians, and certainly with early research, we are noticing rising rates since this pandemic started, not just of infections with coronavirus, but also very concerningly, rising rates of depression and anxiety, of substance abuse problems, and even suicide. A recent survey, for example, reported that nearly half of Americans believe that the coronavirus pandemic and the associated lockdowns have adversely impacted their mental health. So the first thing that I want to say in this regard is that if you are struggling with these or with other related mental health problems, you are not alone. Human beings are not built for what we're going through right now. This is simply not normal. So if you're wondering, why am I so stressed? Why am I so anxious? Why am I so gloomy or having a hard time getting out of bed? The first thing to realize is that this is an entirely understandable reaction to what we're going through. At the same time, it's, it's something that causes a great deal of anguish and suffering. Depression and anxiety and related problems are, are nothing to, to sniff at. And so in this talk, I want to not just sort of describe the nature of the problem and why this might be happening during the lockdowns, but more importantly, I want to offer uh, seven or eight practical and concrete suggestions that you and your families and your friends can implement in order to try to reduce your risk of these problems or to help you recover from these problems if you're suffering in this way. And I want to begin by sort of describing a common pattern that I'm seeing in my own patients since the, since the stay-at-home orders began. And the pattern involves a kind of disruption, obviously, to our normal routines. So a person may stay up late until 2 in the morning because they don't necessarily have to get up early for work the next day, you know, binge-watching Tiger King on Netflix snacking on potato chips, and then the next morning sleeping in till 10 or 11 in the morning because there's no urgency to get up and go to work. 
they might stay in their pajamas all day or maybe throw on a shirt if they have to go to a Zoom meeting. Uh, but there are fewer, obviously fewer face-to-face -face encounters with other people, oftentimes a lot less meaningful work. There's a few things that I can do from home, but a lot of things have been put on the back burner until I can get back to the office. Or, or maybe, maybe one has lost one's job. Uh, and so there's even less structure and less uh, that's sort of pressing on me and, and, and demanding uh, work or discipline. And this produces a kind of, this kind of a recipe for an unhealthy sleep-wake cycle, very little physical activity if it's hard to get to the gym uh, or to, to do our normal uh, physical activities, too much screen time, maybe, maybe the use of excess alcohol or the use of drugs to cope with boredom or to manage stress or to reduce anxiety that we might be experiencing over the possibility of losing my job or the, the fact of being unemployed or even anxiety about acquiring the virus itself. I came down with coronavirus about a month ago and uh, thanks be to God in my case, it wasn't too severe, I didn't need to be hospitalized. And it's been kind of liberating since then, not to worry as much about acquiring the infection. But as someone who works at a hospital, I think I didn't realize just how that, that fear of acquiring the virus or passing it along to my family members was always there in the back of my mind and, and no doubt affecting my overall level of, of stress. So the coronavirus pandemic has produced many disruptions in our society, obviously, but I wanna, I wanna maybe summarize the kinds of typical disruptions that it has created in our own biological and psychological rhythms. Whether or not you suffer from a, a diagnosable mental health condition, we've seen disruptions to what psychiatrists and physicians call our circadian rhythm, the natural sleep-wake cycle that our brain engages in every day. Disruptions to our social connections. We know that loneliness and social isolation had reached epidemic proportions even prior to the coronavirus pandemic. So this is exacerbating a social problem that was there even before the pandemic started this year. Disruptions, obviously, to our work routines. Disruptions to our everyday sense of meaning and purpose. We're, we're sort of waiting and biding our time, waiting for this to be over rather than seeing each day as a gift and trying to use this time well. And I wanna to suggest to you that, that we, can, we can choose to see the current pandemic only and exclusively as a crisis, and no doubt it is a kind of crisis. I don't wanna minimize or trivialize that fact, but we can see it only as a crisis or we could see it as, yes, a crisis, but also an opportunity, an opportunity for psychological and spiritual growth. So here are my eight recommendations for maintaining and preserving and recovering our mental health during this pandemic. And the overarching theme of these recommendations involves, you could say, reintroducing some of the structure that was lost or that has been lost by these disruptions. So let's start with sleep, because I'm seeing lots and lots of patients coming to our clinic who have never had problems with sleep in the past, now suffering from insomnia or other sleep-related difficulties. Some basic sort of sleep hygiene 101 that all of us can practice. Even if you don't have to get up and go to work, try to get up at a fixed time every day. And try to avoid napping during the day. Another thing that you can do to entrain the circadian rhythm into your brain is within an hour of getting up in the morning, try to get outside and yet that, let that ultraviolet light from the sun hit your retina, hit your eye. There's a direct connection between sunlight hitting your retina and the hypothalamus in your brain, the, the central control and coordination center of your brain that controls your circadian rhythm. Regular meal times can also, very interestingly, help 
re-entrain your brain and your body to know when it should be awake and when it should sleep. So our, our metabolism actually changes uh, as we get disruptions to our circadian rhythm. We know that people who have the exact same diet, the exact same caloric intake, but who work night shifts will tend to gain weight, even though they're eating exactly the same thing as they were eating when they had their day shifts. I would add a social dimension to food and meal times as well. And that's, uh, you know, some of us live alone, and this is obviously going to be harder in that context, but if we live with other people, really trying to prioritize family meal times. Again, we could see this as a crisis or we could see it as an opportunity, right? Johnny doesn't have soccer practice today and Susie doesn't have to go to violin or ballet. So we can actually sit down and eat, to, eat dinner together as a family more frequently during the stay-at-home period than we did uh, prior to the coronavirus lockdowns. A friend of mine who's a, who's a public speaker and expert on parenting, he's written several books, likes to say that the most important school that your children will ever attend is the family dinner table, which is a really beautiful thought, right? So let's, let's make mealtimes not just a chance to sort of refuel and, you know, ingest the biological material that we need to keep our body going, but let's approach it in a very human way as an opportunity to, opportunity to sit with those that we live with, to sit with those that we love and share nourishment together, share conversation together, find out how everyone is doing, reconnect in ways that perhaps were more challenging when our lives were busy because we were going every which direction in the evening. So sleep, regular meal times. Third recommendation is even if we happen to be out of work or even if our usual professional work has been put temporarily on hold during stay-at-home orders, to nonetheless set aside time every day for work. Could be professional projects that have been on the back burner. Could be home improvement projects. It could be projects of personal development. Right? Take an online course. Start going through the uh, a reading list, those, those books that you've always wanted to get to but never had time. Uh, take up a hobby, a musical instrument. Use this as an opportunity to do things that in the ordinary course of events you don't have time for. Recommendation number four is to set aside fixed time every day for prayer. We can live stream the Mass, obviously not the same as going to Mass every day, but if our work schedule made it difficult to attend daily mass during the week, well, here's an opportunity to get into the liturgical rhythm of daily mass, to participate in the feast days that we see sprinkled throughout the, the calendar, throughout the liturgical year. It's good to set aside time for other forms of prayer as well, besides trying to follow the church's liturgy mental prayer, sometimes called contemplative prayer, just sitting in silence, in quiet contemplation, in quiet conversation, heart to heart with our Lord, with the Holy Spirit, with God the Father. Vocal prayers like the rosary, spiritual reading, chapter a day from the New Testament, 10 minutes a day from another good spiritual book, maybe something that one of the Napa Institute speakers has written, or one of the, the classics of Catholic spirituality, again, that you've al always wanted to get to but maybe never had time for or thought you didn't have time for, here's a wonderful opportunity. The coronavirus produces a lot of anxiety. The, the air is almost thick with it. And one of the remedies, without sort of trivializing uh, clinical levels of anxiety without suggesting that all anxiety can be solved by prayer. We do have solid scientific research showing that prayer and meditation, quiet contemplative prayer, meditative reading, can diminish 
anxiety. And of course, for Catholics, there's the additional component of prayer allowing us to place these worries into the hands of God, our loving Father, to, to remind ourselves of our divine filiation, this, this deepest truth about ourselves and about our existence, that God is my loving Father, that I am a son of God, I am a daughter of God, I'm a child of God, so that, so that I can abandon these concerns into the loving hands of God's providence. Physical activity is very important. I'm not going to use the word exercise because that can intimidate some people. But if you're, if you're getting outside for a few minutes within an hour of waking up, which is my recommendation to cue your body that it's morning, it's time to be alert, it's time to be awake, uh, use that as a, as a chance to do a brisk walk around the neighborhood. Wear a mask if, if you need to, if the, if the neighbors would prefer that. Uh, but get outside, get moving, inside, you know, start engaging in some form of physical activity, whether that's a, an exercise video, uh, stationary bike, anything that you can find and anything that's available is going to be helpful, not just for your physical health, but also for your mental health. So, for example, for mild to moderate depression, studies, repeated studies have shown that 30 minutes of aerobic exercise four times a week is as effective as an antidepressant medication. More severe forms of depression becomes very hard to, to exercise and engage in physical activity, but if you have mild symptoms of depression and you want your antidepressant medication to work better, or maybe you want to avoid going on an antidepressant medication, start with 30 minutes a day, four or five days a week of a regimen of physical activity or aerobic exercise, and you will see benefits from that. Not right away, not the next day, but cumulative effects over time as you do this for a few weeks. And I know that when you're feeling depressed, that's precisely when you feel like exercising the least, but if you can get yourself to do it, if you can motivate yourself, uh, maybe, maybe exercise with someone else who's living in your, in your household to, to motivate one another, precisely when you feel like doing it the least, it can be the most beneficial. One of the effects of depression is that it tends to make us withdraw. We feel like we have very little energy, very little gas left in the tank, and the, and the, the impulse or the inclination is to want to conserve that energy. I'm just going to stay in bed. I'm not going to get up. I'm not going to exert myself. But there's a kind of paradox here that with depression, in order to replenish your energy, you have to expend the little energy that you have. You have to push yourself beyond what you're comfortable with in terms of physical activity, in terms of connecting with other people socially. And if you do this steadily over time, your gas tank is going to start filling up. That physical energy, that emotional energy, that motivation will begin to improve. I know it's difficult. Um, but anything, anything you can do to help motivate yourself or to get external props and supports from other people to help motivate you will be very beneficial. So physical activity. Recommendation number six, find creative ways to maintain social connections. All right, so I've, I've been sort of down on, on screen time. But of course, uh, too much screen time can be a problem, but, but if especially if you're isolated and you live alone, obviously a Zoom meeting or a video chat or a FaceTime with your family, with your friends, is better than social isolation. So learn how to use these technologies in positive ways to maintain daily connections with other people, to maintain you know, a weekly connection with my family or with my extended family, that you know, Sunday afternoon Zoom call with uh, family, that, that family that's living at a distance, uh, this might be a good time for that. If everyone is at home and, you know, six months ago it may have been hard to coordinate something like this, well, now everyone is, is much more available. This is an opportunity to do that. As an act of charity, if you have neighbors, if you have older family members who are not proficient in the use of these technologies, reach out to them. 
walk them through the process of downloading that video chat app and showing them how to use it and making sure they, they get dialed in to group chats or to, or to virtual get-togethers. Uh, this is one of the things that we can do to help address this profound problem of loneliness and social isolation, especially among the elderly, especially among people who live alone, especially among those who may be living in a, in a nursing home with very strict visitation requirements during this time. Be somewhat careful with social media. Social media can be a way to connect with other people, but it can also be a way to make unfavorable con comparisons between myself and other people. T people tend to present their best selves on social media. They don't tend to come on social media and describe that they're feeling stressed or anxious or depressed or they're starting to drink more or whatever. So uh, limit your time if you're finding that Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is making you feel more isolated or more lonely uh, or more like a failure or whatever. Okay. Maybe it's time to set that aside and pick up the phone and call someone uh, or, or FaceTime someone face to face and have a real human encounter so that you can, you can have someone that you can describe your difficulties to so that you can hear that they too are struggling in this time. Maybe not with the exact same thing that you're struggling with, but, but they have their own weaknesses, their own vulnerabilities, their own challenges and difficulties. Recommendation number seven involves service to others. Getting outside of ourselves and giving ourselves generously to other people in very small, simple ways every day will help you regain a sense of meaning and purpose, will give you some direction, will help you to realize that yeah, I may be struggling with uh, working from home, which is a, you know, a little bit of a nuisance, but I can see that, that there are people that have been laid off from my company that have it actually much worse. At least I still have a paycheck. Uh, I need to reach out to those folks and see what they need or even just offer them a word of, of encouragement. Right? Handwritten letters are an extraordinary uh, gift. They, they are a real pick-me-up. They're something that can certainly brighten anyone's spirit, precisely because they're so rare these days when it's much easier to just fire off an email or a text message or a, a direct message over social media. So maybe one of the little things I'm going to do is sit down every day and just write a brief handwritten note to a family member or to a friend or to an old friend that maybe I've lost touch with and now is a good opportunity to reconnect with them. Eighth and final recommendation is to do an examination of conscience in terms of how we are living the virtue of temperance, right? The, that, that human virtue that helps us to regulate our various appetites. Uh, we know that alcohol consumption has gone up during the pandemic and alcohol consumption in and of itself is, is not a bad thing. Uh, we, we can recall the the in vino veritas get togethers at the napa conference when uh, when we're able to get together in person what a you know what a wonderful way for us to connect with other people over over good wine enjoyed responsibly but if we find ourselves drinking alone if we find ourselves drinking in order to self medicate our anxiety or our depression we may need to we may need to pull back, right? Maybe, maybe I'm going to limit my drinking just to virtual happy hours or virtual get-togethers where, you know, 6 p.m. on a Friday evening, uh, we, we get on Zoom with, with some friends and, and chat over a beer or have a conversation over a glass of wine. Uh, certainly if we're using drugs, including prescription drugs that were not prescribed to us in order to self-medicate or manage anxiety or depression, it's time to seek a consultation with, ideally with a psychiatrist or if, if one is not available with, with a primary care physician to see you know, if there's a better way for me to deal with or treat 
uh, my, my depression or my anxiety or my high level of, of stress. The final point I want to make is that if you are struggling with depression or anxiety in ways that are really starting to impair your daily functioning, right? I'm trying to put into effect these recommendations that I heard in this talk, and I, I literally can't do it. I feel too overwhelmed, or I feel so sapped of energy that I literally cannot get up and brush my teeth in the morning. It's time to seek clinical attention. It's time to seek evaluation from a psychiatrist. And if you're wondering about the possibility of going into a clinic, most uh, physicians, most psychiatrists and psychologists have converted to uh, video visits. So you, you can do a consultation you know, from your own home with a physician or a mental health professional and see, is there something going on here that may require psychotherapy or medication treatment or some other medical intervention in order to address? This is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, there is, unfortunately, an unjust and unfair social stigma that still attaches to mental health conditions or mental illness. Uh, but just as it would be foolish for someone suffering from diabetes to refuse insulin or to refuse medical interventions for that condition, so likewise, if you're suffering from a level of clinical depression or severe anxiety that's impairing your functioning, it, it would be foolish to not avail yourself of uh, potential medicinal remedies of the help that professionals can offer. And it's not an either or proposition, right? Should I, should I try to exercise and, and eat more healthy and get my sleep in order, or should I take a medication for my severe depression? Well, you can do both. And in fact, the medication may make it possible, more possible for you to do those activities. And those activities will in turn make the medication work better. We know from research that a medication alone for depression can be effective, and psychotherapy alone for depression can be effective. And at least for mild depression, exercise alone can be effective. But if you put these things together, you get better outcomes, a faster recovery, more full remission of symptoms than if you just do one or the other of these things alone. So think of this as a both and rather than an either or kind of proposition. In closing, I'll mention just a few examples of people who lived through these kinds of difficulties or even sort of more uh, severe circumstances than this. The first is a 20th century psychiatrist, a man by the name of Viktor Frankl, who was a Jewish man who was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. He was imprisoned in Auschwitz. And he noticed there that those people who managed to survive in those horrifying human circumstances did so only because they were able, in those circumstances, to find a sense of meaning and purpose, to find a sense of hope. And of course, as Catholics, we know that hope is a theological virtue. It's not something that can be delivered in the form of a pill. So getting up in the morning, praying, connecting with God, asking him, what is it that you want of me today? It may not be something huge and heroic. It probably won't be. It may be a series of small acts of charity, a series of small things that I'm working on to make, to make my life better, to make my family's life better, to make my home uh, more of a home. Everyone needs something like that in order to get through difficult circumstances. We can mention as uh, one kind of contemporary 20th century saint, the example of Saint Jose Maria Escriva, a saint that I'm very fond of. I've learned a lot about uh, the spirituality of work and the spirituality of being a lay person from him. But during the Spanish Civil War, he was, he was in Spain, he was a Spanish priest. During the Spanish Civil War, when they were literally assassinating and murdering priests, thousands of them died. Uh, he had to hide because he was a priest. 
And for a time, he found refuge in the Honduran consulate. He had a friend who had a connection there. And so there were, there were dozens of people crammed into very small spaces. So he and, and a few other young men were staying in a tiny room together where they, they barely had enough room to sort of lay their, their sleeping bags out on the floor and their blankets out on the floor. Uh, but he decided right away that we're not going to be idle here. We're not just going to see this as something to kind of bide our time and get through. We are going to use this productively, right? Even though externally the, uh, the environment isn't very conducive to prayer and to work and to personal development, nonetheless, we're making a schedule. We're going to have prayer at a certain time every day. We're going to have mass. And he would, he would say mass when he could acquire bread and wine. And when he couldn't, he would do a kind of dry mass going through the liturgy, but without the consecration, without Holy Communion. Uh, then uh, then he, and his, uh, he and his friends would do things like study foreign languages and, uh, and, and work for set periods of time every day in order to uh, in order to acquire new knowledge or new skills that would be useful to their apostolate in the future. Right? And what they noticed during this time is that as difficult as it was, they were able to maintain their, their good spirits. Uh, certainly, th this was a struggle, but those around them who just sort of languished, who were twiddling their thumbs and staring at the walls and waiting for all this to be over, tended to sink into a kind of lethargy and a kind of depression. So he can be a good, good saint for us uh, to look to for inspiration or a good intercessor for us during these challenging times. If you want to read more about his work and especially the time during uh, his, his confinement in the Honduran consulate, John Coverdale's biography called Uncommon Faith is a very good read. So in closing, I want to remind all of you that everyone is going through a difficult time right now. You are not alone. If you're struggling, this is not unusual. There is hope for recovery. Follow the advice that I've given. If that isn't sufficient to help you and you're still struggling with daily activities, reach out to your doctor, get a referral to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, arrange a consultation, uh, and don't be afraid to ask for help from those around you, from your family, from your friends. Don't be afraid to talk about your struggles during this time because most likely those people you reach out to for help will also be struggling in their own way. And to connect with them and share the difficulties that we're going through is in and of itself the first step toward recovery. Uh, I wish you all the best. I'm praying for all of you during this challenging time. I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you in person at next year's Napa Conference, if we're able to gather. God bless you.